Hello, welcome to PCAP's fifth Prairie's Got the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Moreau Seiler and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan or PCAP. This is the last webinar of Prairie's Got the Goods Week this week. Today, Dr. Tim Dober, postdoctoral fellow with the University of Alberta, will be speaking about cattle grazing effects on water infiltration in grassland soils. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. This is, as I mentioned, this is the last webinar of Prairie's Got the Goods Week. The other five webinars from this past week can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. And I'd like to note that this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. If you've enjoyed PCAP's Prairie's Got the Goods Week, I'd like to invite you to check out our monthly Native Prairie Speaker Series. We have a webinar next week about invasive species and topics after that include bees, birds and bats. And just check out the PCAP website for more information and click on upcoming event and Native Prairie Speaker Series. Prairie's Got the Goods Week would not be possible without our sponsors. I would like to sincerely thank our presenting sponsors, Sask Energy and Wildlife Habitat Canada, as well as our supporting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask and Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, you will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you're on a cell phone, you can send uh, your question to chat by, uh, to the organizer and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about today's presenter. Dr. Tim Dobert is a global change ecologist with primary research interests in biodiversity and ecosystem function. He recently completed a postdoctoral fellowship under supervision of Professor Mark Boyce at the University of Alberta, working on large-scale agricultural greenhouse gases program grazing management project. In collaboration with an interdisciplinary team of researchers, he studies the influence of adaptive multi-paddock grazing, AMP, a type of rest rotation grazing that references bison herd effects on ecosystem processes and biodiversity in Western Canada's grasslands. Research foci include the role of grazing on soil carbon sequestration, greenhouse gas fluxes, plant productivity, water infiltration, soil microbial function, enzyme activity, and socioeconomic metrics. Dr. Dobert was recently awarded a MITAX Evaluate or Elevate postdoctoral fellowship to conduct scenario-based modeling in the context of carbon and hydrological models under supervision of Dr. Moner Ferramarzi at University of Alberta. He holds a PhD from the University of Western Australia, for which he investigated the impacts of logging and oil palm expansion on native biodiversity in Borneo's lowland tropical rainforests. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Dobert. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Can can you hear me okay? And yes, we can, and we can. Looking fine. Yeah, everything looks good. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much for the welcoming introduction, and also to the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan Partnership for the opportunity to present some of our research. And of course, thank you very much to everyone tuning in today for your interested interest in this topic. So I'm based in Edmonton and I would like to begin my presentation by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land by refer referencing a University of Alberta statement. So the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we're located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples including the Cree, Blackfoot, Metis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dean, Ojibwe, Solto, Anishibabe, Anishinabe, sorry, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. And I would also like to emphasize that I'm presenting research 
which was conducted in the context of a much larger study to which many colleagues and ranchers have contributed over the past five years. So some of you might have listened to Edward Borg and Barat Schrester um, talk about grazing management practices and greenhouse gas dynamics on Wednesday as part of this webinar series. So my presentation today is going to link to their work. And okay, so in today's webinar, I'm going to explore the effects of grazing on water infiltration in Western Canada, Canada's grasslands. And I will present results that were recently submitted to a scientific journal. So let's first consider why a better understanding of grazing effects on grassland hydrology is important. Well, water infiltration largely determines soil water availability, which in turn underpins the capacity of grasslands to provide a range of ecosystem goods and services that are essential to our well being and livelihood. So, first of all, the availability of water regulates plant productivity, which in a grassland context equates to the provisioning of forage for livestock. And of course, their productivity and palatability differences between annual and perennial species, and for example, native and introduced plants. But generally speaking, there's a production benefit associated with an increase in plant productivity on grazing lands. And the same same concept, of course, applies to crop yields. So water availability to plants is really critical for food security. More green biomass then basically leads to higher photosynthetic activity and greater carbon sequestration. So the flow chart I'm showing here on the left is, of course, a very basic illustration only, and there's more reciprocal flows between those different aspects. But this is really just trying to causally show how water infiltration leads to um, carbon capture or carbon sequestration. And at the same time, hydrological processes, including water infiltration, are closely coupled to soil carbon transport. And I'm indicating this here with those red circles. So for example, there's surface runoff, which can lead to erosion of particulate organic carbon through organic matter transport. And also groundwater transport can lead to vertical leaching of dissolved organic carbon out of the soil or to lateral transport of dissolved organic carbon within the soil body. So the fate of precipitation, whether it infiltrates into the soil or is washed away through runoff, has really a strong influence on the overall balance of organic carbon that we find in the, in, in the soil. And this matters for a number of reasons. So one aspect I would like to briefly touch on is this concept of carbon trading. And admittedly, I'm making a bit of a jump here. So the idea of carbon markets is basically to have marketplaces where carbon credits are traded between a, a greenhouse gas emitter. So we see that on the left of this um, illustration. Let's say there could be an oil or gas company. And then a carbon offset developer, which could be, for example, a rainforest conservation offset project. So the offset project generates carbon credits by reducing emissions. For example, in, so in the forest context, it could be because a forest is, is not being burned and converted for cropland. And also by sequestering carbon, which um, especially in the context of an old growth forest, um, is really high. There's a lot of carbon stored in an old growth forest ecosystem. So the oil and gas company then seeks to offset their emissions, which could be as a voluntary commitment to achieving net zero emissions, or it could be under a cap and trade system where large polluters are required by law to offset emissions above a certain emission threshold. So this, for example, is um, like the output based pricing system, the OBPS which is in place in Canada. And this then could be done by buying carbon credits from this rainforest offset project. Now, carbon credit trading schemes in the forest context have been around for quite some time. But in recent years, there's been an increasing interest in developing carbon offset markets for grassland ecosystems as well. And in fact, there's already a number of offset protocols which are now in effect or being trialed in different parts of the world. And I would like to introduce a few. So there's in Australia, for example, 
um, has a voluntary carbon offset scheme integrated in, in the, into their so-called emissions reduction fund, which is part of a carbon farming, which, which is called a carbon farming initiative. And this allows land managers to earn carbon credits by changing land use or management practices that have been verified as being effective for storing carbon or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, and already to date, a number of livestock ranchers have benefited, have benefited from the scheme, including this one, which I'm highlighting here in New South Wales. So that's a very recent posting or newspaper article where ran a rancher received, um, where ranchers sold carbon credits to Microsoft worth half a million Australian dollars, which is similar, similar to Canadian dollars, um, which really sounds like a lucrative business. And then if we look at across the border to the US, there's, for example, the Montana Grasslands Carbon Initiative, which came into life in 2019. And this promotes a shift to rotational grazing practices specifically. So the, con the concept is that by that participating ranchers can receive upfront funding to allow for a transition to rotational grazing practices which is purely based on the pre-assumption that rotational grazing actually improves soil carbon sequestration. So basically the potential soil carbon gains associated with this shift to rotational grazing are then modeled and the rancher gets carbon credits that can then again be sold in, in a market system. And of course they're not using one size, uh, one size fits all approach. It's, it's still individual to the rancher, but it's largely just a conceptual idea. And finally, if we're looking at a Canadian context, so since 2019, there has been a Canada grassland protocol under the Climate Action Reserve, which focuses on financially rewarding avoided conversion of grasslands, both for carbon and conservation, both for the carbon and the conservation value of grassland ecosystems. And you might have heard the announcement made just a few days ago that the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association is launching a pilot project to help conserve native grasslands. And I understand this is, this is strongly linked to the Canada Grassland Protocol. And I'm also aware that the Saskatchewan government started an offset program in 2019, and they're currently having detailed discussions on how to roll this out. And from what I've heard, there's, there's a high chance there's going to be a protocol in the context of rotational grazing as well. So surely we're going to see more carbon offsets in the near future um, with a focus on Canada's grasslands and especially where the federal and provincial governments are increasingly recognizing the importance of incentivizing protection, restoration and more sustainable management of these grassland ecosystems as part of their climate change mitigation and biodiversity conservation commitments. So I'd now briefly like to look at nature-based solutions. So the principles of protecting, restoring, and sustainably managing land and resources towards fixing the deeply entwined global challenges. So beyond climate change, other challenges as well. But those three pillars, which are now often referred to as these nature-based solutions. And they're basically solutions to societal challenges that involve working with nature. So this is important. So by definition, nature-based solutions are not, for example, renewable energies or nature-inspired engineer, engineering. So it's really this idea of working with nature. And scientists estimate that nature-based solutions involving all ecosystems of so forests and grasslands and mangroves and, um, everything around the world that you find can contribute around 30% of the CO2 mitigation needed by 2030 to really stabilize climate warming below two degrees Celsius. So in the infographic that you see, I'm highlighting the contribution that grassland protection and improved grassland grazing management can contribute towards avoiding emissions and storing more greenhouse gases in ecosystems. So you would notice that there's no explicit mentioning of, of grassland restoration, which I assume might be because changes in management could actually lead to grassland restoration, which is a bit different for forests and wetlands where there 
might be more interference, active interference requ required to restore an ecosystem. And of course, to mention phasing out fossil fuels um, has to take center stage in any global commitments to net zero carbon emissions in the coming decades. But because there's so much urgency in the climate crisis, uh, with serious systemic changes expected much earlier than 2050, we actually need to use diverse approaches that include both cutting further greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere and also removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, again, by working with nature, with, which is a very cost-effective strategy. So why do grasslands offer so much scope as a nature-based solution? Well, when we look at the distribution of grassy biomes around the world, we see that naturally grasslands cover more than 30% of the world's terrestrial surface including extensive areas across the temperate and tropical regions. So I have encircled the major temperate grasslands here, including um, the North, North American prairies. And the majority of these grasslands is grazed for livestock production. So globally, grazing is actually the single most widespread human land use. And looking at Western Canada, here alone over 15 million hectares, are used for grazing. So considering these numbers, it immediately becomes clear that grazing management decisions can cumulatively have profound consequences for the environment and the climate. And such effects are unfortunately witnessed in the widespread, widespread degradation of grasslands in many parts of the world due to improper grazing. And degradation and perhaps even more drastically desertification is of course an extreme endpoint on the spectrum of gray grassland conditions. However, I think the important point to make is that even otherwise well-functioning grasslands may have additional capacity to improve their carbon balance. So that is to emit less greenhouse gases and also to store more carbon. So considering the overall very large soil carbon debt, debt in the world's gray grasslands, there now exists a significant opportunity to capitalize on nature-based solutions and climate-smart agriculture to rebuild grasslands into more resilient production landscapes that can simultaneously contribute to a low carbon economy. So as described in the context of nature-based solutions, there are strong arguments for pursuing this triple approach so first of all, by conserving remaining grasslands, we can avoid the release of large quantities of organic carbon into the atmosphere. And we can safeguard other ecosystem services and, and also, which is important, habitat for species. Then we should also restore more degraded and perhaps unproductive grasslands like marginal lands for the same reasons. But in all this, we need to consider, of course, there's trade-offs with food production as well. When it comes to grassland management strategies um, in Canada, I would say there are two overarching approaches, which are grazing and prescribed, grazing and prescribed burning. So for the remainder of the presentation, I will focus on the grazing management aspect. And specifically, I'm going to talk about adaptive multi-paddock grazing. So the conceptual foundation of AMP grazing is a strategic use of animal impact, similar to the herd effect that is being proposed in holistic management. So the idea is basically to mimic natural rot rotational grazing dynamics by large keys on herbivores, such as the bison in North America. And the core features of AMP grazing are really the use of very short grazing periods at high stocking densities which are then followed by a lengthy rest period that is adequate for plants to regenerate from the grazing pressure. This is because holistic grazing management postulates that the causes for overgrazing in many parts of the world are actually not because of too many animals, but instead insufficient rest. So really for, the, for them it's about, or for this principle it's about the timing of grazing that's important. And across North America, 
AMP grazing seems to become quite popular amongst the ranch ranching community. And I think this is in part because many ranchers who have switched to AMP grazing are really reporting good ranch um, production and health outcomes. However, in the science arena, there still remains a lot of debate on whether the AMP grazing truly delivers environmental benefits. And a major issue so far has been the lack of large scale studies that really capture this broad, the, the broad gradients in management practices and biophysical environments used for cattle grazing. So this brings me to the grazing management project, which I have been part of for just over two years. So it's been running for five years. And as mentioned, the specific research, which I'm going to talk about shortly, is part of this larger five-year study, and it's it's funded by the Agricultural Greenhouse Gases Program. So this large-scale study was primarily motivated to study the carbon sequestration and storage potential of adaptive multi-paddock grazing compared to a spectrum of alternative grazing systems or grazing practices. But the data also includes a range of other ecosystem processes, um, such as greenhouse gas emissions and plant biomass. And, and there's also certain, there are also certain socioeconomic aspects like a financial viability as assessment for switching to AMP grazing, which are, which are part of this larger study. So for this study, AMP ranches were initially identified through select grazing criteria um, with each AMP ranch matched to a neighboring ranch employing regionally representative conventional grazing for comparison on similar ecocides. So this was very important in the initial state, stage to, to really get those matching pairs right. Then we also tried to standardize cultivation history amongst the ranch pairs so that both were either non-cultivated or both cultivated in the past. And eventually we ended up with 64 livestock producers across the prairie, prairie provinces, which by design included 30, 32 AMP and 32 neighboring ranches. And if you would like to learn a little bit more about the project design and scope, I have included a link on, I think it's the last but one slide of my presentation to Professor Mark Boyce's talk, which he gave last, last year as part of this webinar series. Um, so I would encourage you to listen to that presentation if you're interested. So with a brief, with a bit of an introductory detour, I'm now coming back to actual research on hydrological processes in grazed grasslands. And I will try to tie these background information on carbon offset markets and nature-based solutions to the water infiltration research in, in my final conclusions. So one of the proposed benefits of adaptive multi paddock grazing is enhanced water infiltration. So let's look at briefly at, um, at why that is. So according to the holistic management philosophy, intense but brief animal impacts can break up physical soil crusts and facilitate the integration of dead plant material into the soil. This process is thought to have positive effects on hydrological processes through the buildup of soil organic matter and reduced soil compaction. And this in turn should then enhance water infiltration and retention in the soil, as well as reduced runoff and associated soil erosion. And now looking at the specific two overarching study objectives, so first, our objective was to better understand the relationship between grazing practices and grassland hydrology. So we investigated whether water infiltration rates of grassland soils under AMP grazing differed from those of neighboring properties, where the latter was assumed to represent a regionally representative sample of beef cattle ranches across the prairies. And moreover, we assessed the influence of various grazing practices on water infiltration rates over and above cultivation, biophysical and climatic effects. 
So the inclusion of these nuanced grazing practices is quite important because very few studies have the data to account for detailed ranch level management practices. But the problem is we likely miss important details when we only focus on grazing systems or say categorical grazing intensity levels. And I'm going to introduce those specific grazing practices shortly. A few words about the study outline. So we selected 52 of our uh, pool of project ranches with again pairs matched by cultivation history and 20 of these ranches were in Alberta, 24 in Saskatchewan and eight in Manitoba and the locations are indicated with those blue, blue dots on the map. So across all the ranches the majority was cultivated which is 42 out of the 52 and that usually means it was previously seeded as part of the cultivation process and um, that's usually an average of nine, about 19 years um, since reg regressing started. So with these ranches, as you can see in the map, we actually captured a very wide gradient in climate, in soils, in vegetation, and also land management. So six of the ranches are in mixed grass prairie, there's 36 in the fescue grasslands of the foothills and parkland regions, and 10 in the boreal transition zone. And we have this annual precipitation gradient from around 325 to 630 millimeters and an annual temperature gradient from 1.2 to 4.8 degrees Celsius. So looking at the infiltration rate measurements, both the water and soil samples which I'm going to refer to here, were collected by collaborators from Applied Ecological Services, which are based in Wisconsin, and they use the standard sampling protocol. So on each ranch, three water infiltration measurements were collected within a 10 hectare area, and then in alignment with the soil core sampling location. So they were immediately um, next to one another those sampling sampling spots so the AES crew used this so-called saturo dual head fill infil, infiltrometer which basically measures the field saturated hydraulic conductivity and that's a measure of the ease with which water moves into the soil and you, you can see the set the full setup in the right photo so basically what they did was to first clip all the live vegetation at ground level and remove it from the sampling area. And the end result you can you can see in the image in the left, on the left. And then once the infiltrometer ring was inserted into the soil, they pre-soaked the soil within the ring to a standard satur saturation level. And then they used three measurement cycles during which they applied alternate periods of low and high pressure onto a column of water that was maintained above the sampling area. And this entire process lasts about 75 to 75 minutes to three hours, and then results in a single water infiltration output value, which I then used for the analyses. And there are a number of biophysical parameters which, which we know play an important role for water infiltration. And here we were able to account for plant litter, soil texture, and soil group density. So we do not have organic matter content, which is, which is pretty much the other biophysical variable that is very important and known to influence water infiltration. So you're probably familiar um, with these parameters per se, but let's, let's briefly look at how these three biophysical drivers are generally expected to interact with precipitation. So in general, plant litter, which is also dead plant material, helps to reduce runoff and evaporation and can increase soil moisture content in spring by trapping snow. And however, just to note, it can also actually reduce soil moisture content by intercepting rainfall and reducing the amount of water reaching the soil surface. Also when litter decomposes it enriches the soil with soil with organic matter 
which in turn improve soil structure and the hydrological properties. Next, looking at soil texture. Soil texture is important because it influences water infiltration as well as the moisture holding capacity of soils. And usually coarse sandy soils hold less water and have higher infiltration rates due to comparatively large soil pores. While in contrast, fine textured soils like say a clay soil has a higher water holding capacity. And similarly, soil bulk density is an important physical property for regulating hydrological processes. It is largely influenced by soil organic matter content and texture, and it basically it, it's basically an indicator of soil compaction. So for the sampling across all 52 ranches, we collected a total of 780 soil cores down to a maximum of one meter. And so this was collected as part of the larger HDP study and that's basically 15 cores per ranch. And you know, AES used this very fancy soil sampler for drilling the cores. And you can see in the bottom right image, it sort of gives an, gives an idea of what a core looks like. And on each ranch, three of the cores, as I mentioned earlier, coincided spatially with the individual water infiltration sampling locations. And we, we used fractions of each soil sample to then determine bulk density of the AH layer and also to quantify clay, silt and sand content of the soil. The plant litter sampling locations were also aligned with water infiltration measurement sites and the plant ecology team used these 50 by 50 centimeter quadrats that you can see in the little image in the top right corner for framing the area and then from this area they collected the above ground litter. Because we focused our analyses on the ranch scale, all individual measurements of soil biomass and water infiltration were averaged to the ranch level for analyses. And this also helped to align with field measurement, to help to align the field measurements with management data, which again were representing the ranch scale information. And we're fortunate for our study to have these really detailed grazing practices information and, and on land use history. And really thanks to the kind willingness of producers to share those information and i'd emphasize the efforts of sue de bruyne kira dusklaya and edward borg in compiling and processing these processing these information so this is very important because we know that not two of the thousands of ranchers in western canada apply the exact same grazing strategy so a comparison by grazing systems such as amp may not fully capture the more nuanced differences that exist. But more specifically, also because we know that grazing patterns such as the timing, intensity, frequency of livestock use, can really influence soil hydrological properties as these metrics affect vegetation dynamics and soil properties. So I'm briefly going to introduce the metrics that we included in the analysis of the water infiltration study. But I'd like to point out, out if you'd like to know more information on how these metrics were computed and what that really means in detail. I would like to recommend Professor Borg's talk on Wednesday as part of this webinar series. And um, we also had two recent ALIS webinar talks um, two weeks ago, and I included links um, again i think i think it's on the last but one slide so if you're interested to learn more we used the five metrics which are highlighted in sort of mint color in this table including cultivation history stocking rate animal unit density start of the grazing season and rest to grazing ratio and again i will not go into detail on those numbers in the table and just briefly so the cultivation history is, is a binary metric, which just indicates whether grassland had previously been cultivated and seeded. 
stocking rates for each ranch were calculated based on the number of cattle, stock class, and entry and exit dates. And that number is an expression of animal unit months per hectare. And we used animal unit density, which is derived from the mean paddock size and herd sizes while grazing. The start of the grazing season was defined as the first day of early grazing season, with the earliest possible start date set to March 15, to, just to avoid the inclusion of winter grazing, which occurs on a select number of ranches. And finally, the rest to grazing ratio was defined as the number of days of rest per day of early season grazing, which means any grazing prior to August 1. Okay, so now coming to the results. I'm first presenting visualizations of the basic linear relationships between water infiltration rate and select biophysical metrics. So throughout all the figures which I'm going to show, the lighter color always indicates AMP ranches and the darker color, the neighboring properties. And the triangles are previously cultivated. So that's more, there's more triangles. And the circles are the non-cultivated ranches. And also, so the vertical lines are always depicting water infiltration. And on the horizontal axis, I'm showing the biophysical and later the management variables. First, in panel A, we show that water infiltration on AMP ranches increases as more litter accumulates, whereas no significant pattern is observed for neighboring ranches. And just to note, a relationship to be considered significant would be below a p-value of 0.05. So positive relationship between infiltration rate and litter is really what we would expect because as mentioned earlier, litter generally, generally reduces runoff and evaporation of water. So in panel B, we have water infiltration. Uh, we show that water infiltration was positively correlated with soil texture. And soil texture in this case is expressed as the ratio between clay to sand. And this finding is a little bit contrary to what we would expect because it, it suggests that soils rich in clay at higher rates of infiltration. And as described earlier, usually we would expect the opposite where sandy soils, which have larger pore sizes, facilitate the infiltration of water. So I'm not exactly sure why this is. And in panel C, we show that water infiltration rate decreased significantly with increasing bulk density. And that's for both AMP and non-AMP ranches. And really this is very much expected, again, because bulk density is related to soil compaction. So I would like to emphasize again that these figures are only, they're only giving basic relationships of water infiltration and biophysical metrics and significance tests. So, so for the actual analysis, we followed a two-step modeling approach. We first used the so-called mixed model approach to test for the effects of AMP versus neighboring, neighboring ranches. And in addition to the effects of plant litter, soil texture, and bulk density, so we're now bringing the biophysical and the management parameters into the same model. And here we found a significant relationship between water infiltration rate and grazing management with higher infiltration rates on AMP grazed grasslands, which you can see in light gray, than on neighboring properties. And the average infiltration rate on AMP grazed grasslands was about 10.5 centimeters per hour compared to 7.4 centimeters on neighboring properties. In a second step, we now looked at the effects of the more nuanced grazing practices, um, sort of like the grazing, grazing rest to grazing ratio and animal unit density and stocking rate. And in panel A, we show that bulk density had a significant effect on water infiltration rate 
and that effect was consistently negative across grazing treatments. Instead, we did not find any effect of litter and texture when those biophysical and grazing practice variables were combined in, in the same analysis. And so among the grazing practices, we show in panel B that water infiltration rate had a positive association with the rest to grazing ratio, where greater rest resulted in higher water infiltration, which thereby closely reflects the pattern which we observed for AMP grazing in general. And in contrast, we found no significant effect of cattle stocking rate, but we can see a negative trend. And finally, what I'm not showing, what I'm not, not visualizing here, is we found no evidence that the herd effect, so as regulated by animal stock density, leads to improved water infiltration. So a few concluding remarks. Um, so looking at rest first, as mentioned in the beginning, greater water infiltration is considered to be a core benefit of short duration, high intensity grazing, according to the proponents of grazing practices in the context of holistic management. And this, this notion is supported by a result that AMP grazing improves water infiltration. And, and really this finding is consistent with the results of a very recent global synthesis that reported a positive effect of increased grazing pattern complexity, including the use of rotational and adaptive management practices on water infiltration relative to more conventional grazing. Also, previous studies specifically comparing AMP grazing with continuous grazing at light and heavy stocking rates found a similar trend of enhanced water infiltration under AMP grazing or in some cases they reported no difference between the grazing management strategies. These studies, however, were conducted at a much smaller geographic scale and, and usually across substantially fewer study ranches as compared to the present study here. As mentioned, in contrast to the majority of previous studies, we also had the data to explore the more nuanced grazing practices and we really find this is, that this is very important. So while AMP grazing is largely characterized, characterized by both extended rest and the herd effect, we are finding that it is really the extended rest period that aids water infiltration. And this finding lends support to the conclusions of, a, again, a recent meta-analysis, which explored the results of many relevant studies for trends and patterns, and that found that plant recovery gen generally maintains water infiltration. Now, if we're looking at the herd effect, so in contrast to rest periods, we found no evidence that herd effect as regulated by animal stock density leads to improved water infiltration. So this finding in a way contradicts the claim that intense rotational grazing at high stock density can improve water infiltration by breaking up the soil crust, um, where the soil crust is often a limiting, thought to be a limiting factor to water infiltration. And this is important because many studies evaluating short duration grazing in North America have actually shown that intense hoof action in heavily stocked paddocks leads to soil compaction and low infiltration rates relative to continuous grazing at low to moderate stocking rates. And this pattern is also consistent with the same global synthesis I mentioned, which revealed that improvements to water infiltration usually followed a shift from heavy to either moderate or low stocking rates. And actually many studies have reported that the highest infiltration rates are often on grasslands where livestock was excluded. So overall, our results suggest that a focus on adequate rest for plant recovery rather than attempting to mimic a herd effect may lead to improved soil hydrological properties and that's also given the risk of overstocking which is widely recognized as a key driver of grassland degradation and desertification. 
And so as mentioned earlier, I'll now attempt to make the connection between this research study and nature-based solutions and carbon, carbon markets. And I will not really go into depth with this, but there's one point that I would like to make, which is first, with all the excitement about soil carbon, I think it is critical to also not overlook the importance of water because the carbon and water cycles are really closely coupled and we need both to function for healthy grasslands. So in our efforts to identify grazing practices that help to enrich grassland soils with organic carbon, we must also ensure that hydrological processes are equally considered and taken care of. And there will likely be trade-offs that will have to be considered in making those choices. And then on top of this, well, safeguarding biodiversity, such as in an agricultural context, largely pollinators, needs to be taken into account as well when we aim to devise more sustainable and regenerative management practices. Because diversity really underpins ecosystem resilience and stability, um, which is what we need to, to move forward. And this really feeds into this concept of building more resilient landscapes and production systems as some a kind of insurance against the warming climate and more extreme weather events such as droughts which could really worsen in many parts of the prairies over the coming decades so i think while carbon is currently this hook for developing offset schemes there will likely be ecosystem markets in the future that include other ecosystem services as well and we can actually see this see a trend in that direction already for example there's the ecosystem services market consortium in the us which is building a very large scale trade market and that's currently being that's currently in the trialing phase and they not only not only include soil carbon but also water quantity and quality at this point and might expand to different ecosystem services in the near future so to give you an outlook for the AGGP project. The data collection for the project has been completed and official support is for the project is actually en ending this month. So we're coming to our five year um, project de deadline completion. Several manuscripts have been submitted to scientific journals and there are several others which have been drafted and we expect that a number of additional publications will be coming out this year. But to highlight a few benefits of AMP grazing that we have found in addition to improved water infiltration, AMP grazed, grazed ranches had more plant biomass and litter, so suggesting higher productivity. Soils under AMP grazing absorb more methane based on, that's based on incubation experiment experiments and something that Barat and Edward spoke about in their presentation on Wednesday. And we've, we also found a deepened AH soil horizon in AMP grazed grasslands, along with higher levels of soil organic carbon. Okay, so to wrap up, I would finally like to thank our project sponsors, which is the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, for their support over the, fast, over the past five years. And there are many people who have contributed to the project over, the, over this time period. And while I cannot name everyone, everybody very much deserves acknowledgement. But there are several co-authors on this water infiltration study specifically, which I would like to acknowledge. So there's Edward Borg, who holds the Macy's Chair in Rangeland Ecology and Management at the U of A. There's Stephen Apfelbaum, who is the CEO of our US-based collaborator, Applied Ecological Solutions. There's Cameron Carlyle, who is an associate professor in, in the Faculty of Agriculture, Life and Environmental Sciences at the U of A. Scott Chang is a professor in the Faculty of Agriculture, Life and Environmental Sciences. Upama KC is a PhD candidate and she's working on soil, mi soil microbes. Laio Sobrino is an MSc candidate working on the soil organic carbon component of the project. 
Roy Thompson is an ecologist with Applied Ecological Solutions. And Mark Boyce holds the Alberta Conservation Association Chair in Fisheries and Wildlife at the U of A. And he's been the, well, he is the principal investigator on the project. And last but not least, I would, uh, this study would have never been possible without the landowners who really kindly granted access to their properties and shared all their expertise with us. So just a few additional information. If you're interested to learn more about the AGGP Grazing Management Project, um, I recommend this Scientia article, which Professor Mark Boyce wrote, I think, last year. And we also have a project website on which um, select research summaries and outputs can be found. There are also the two ALIS webinar recordings, which I mentioned. And um, there's Mark's Prairie Scope the Goods Week presentation from last year. And you're, you're also welcome to get in touch with Mark, Edward, myself, and I guess everybody else on the project if you, if you have questions and comments. And finally, a few web links to articles in the context of grazing protocols. So these relate to the newspaper articles um, I referenced earlier. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the awesome presentation. It was very, very informative. Uh, we have a few questions from listeners, if that's okay. Um, I can just kind of read them out to you and feel free to flip through your slides if you want or not. And, <laughs> and if it's out of the scope, that's okay too. <laughs> sure. Um, the first one is from Lee. How does increased plant litter reduce soil water content? Okay, how does how does increased litter reduce soil water soil? content? So I, I I hope I said it the other way around. Maybe maybe I didn't, but I think so. So usually when there's more litter, that that really benefits the the water content in the soil. So I think I made I think I made this one comment where there can be cases when there's too much vegetation that it's not actually reaching the ground. So it could say evaporate, for example, prior to actually getting into the soil. I, I hope I we got that question wrong. Okay. We also commented in that um maybe he misheard. Um which is a possibility too. Um, our next um, our next question is from a listener named Barry. How or sorry, on each ranch, how did your field crew choose where to sample, especially for the non AMP ranches? How did you determine what was typical on a non AMP ranch? Yeah, so these these sampling points were allocated randomly, so they used a, a random Sort of a, ran, a way of randomly distributing the points and originally by design it was also trying to focus on different parts of the slope i think that's maybe relating to the question um, possibly underlying because because of the differences along the slope catena or the soil catena so i, I wasn't i wasn't involved in, in actually placing placing the sampling points but but it was randomly done and very much in order to not to not be biased and that's that's both on the amp and non mp ranch and there was a certain i think it was about a 10 hectare area allocated on each of the ranches um, which was then used to sort of superimpose this random sampling design okay perfect um, John is wondering about what is a realistic size of a paddock in this adaptive multi-paddock system? Right, I think that's exceeding, <laughs> I think that's exceeding <laughs> my expertise. I have a feeling that's something Edward Borg would, he, he'd probably have a lot to say on this, so I, I can't answer that with certainty. I think that's really one of the questions that Edward Borg would be a really good person to contact and he's, he's got this expertise on not just the science but actually as a as a rancher himself 
So I'm, I'm, I'm not certain, I can't, can't give an idea. Okay. But having, having said that, I'd, I'd also like to mention that, of course, what we're finding for water infiltration here, we, we might find something somewhat different for different response metrics. So again, we're looking at so, so many different components of the ecosystem, like biomass and enzymes and microbes and um, soil carbon. So, so this is obviously for now unique to the water infiltration. So we need to see a bit further down. Are we finding similar patterns for different response variables? And then can we maybe use this to really, to really um, sort of find find an ideal ideal pattern of rest versus grazing and paddock size? And so hopefully that's something we can. We can really come up with a bit further down the road, but for now, I think Edward would be the best contact. Perfect. Um, the next question is from a listener named John. Uh, how much time does it take for grassland soil to decompact given long rest? Again, I'm I'm very challenged on that question. Um, I, I can't say I can't say that for certain. I'm no not sure. Problem. I think I think yeah. it'll, I think it'll it'll depend so much on, on on the climatic zone and and the types of soils and I think say when Alan Savory was coming up with this holistic management idea it was it was also largely based on on, on the tropics right so there was mm -hmm. tropical region Africa which there might be a very different story um, in in higher latitudes so I think that really depends on so many on so many aspects. I should mention that something I didn't show, but we didn't actually find a, co a significant correlation between bulk density and animal unit density and stocking rate, at least not for the AMP ranches. So we did not find that, say, for example, increasing the number of animals was really influencing say higher bulk density we didn't find that that link for the amp ranches i think we found some something slightly significant in the case of neighboring ranches but only for animal unit sorry for animal yeah for animal unit density but not for stocking rate okay thanks for that answer it sounds like there's lots of different factors in play there um, so the next question is from Daniel. Do you think that grazing by animals with small hooves, uh, such as goats or gazelles, would have a different effect, positive or negative, on water infiltration versus cattle, which have larger hooves? I wouldn't. I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And that's partly, that's in part, I, I don't have any data to support this, but I think even if we're trying to compare compare cattle and bison I, I think I think the science is really showing that there's there's certainly differences so it's not like we're having this big large herbivore which is looking fairly similar and we're trying to mimic how the bison was what we believe grazing the prairies in the past so I think there's even science showing there's really differences between bison and cattle I know there's research in Australia and about two years ago I went to see the scientist in New South Wales, because they're running a, a similar, smaller scale study, but similar idea where they're looking at sheep grazing. And I'd, I'd have to follow up. I'm, I'm certainly happy if, um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the, um, the listener's name. Uh, was, but if, yeah, it was Daniel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Daniel. If, if Daniel would like to reach out and and I, I could I could see if they've already published some some science from Australia, because I think sheep grazing is, is fairly common in that part of the world. Yeah, yeah, that would be quite interesting. Um, the next question is from May. Uh, she says, this research design seems perfect. Is there anything you would suggest as consideration in the design of future research in conventional versus rotational grazing? Right, well, that's a nice compliment, <laughs> which, which I can't take wasn't part of the design, but it was certainly it was certainly carefully designed and really making sure in the initial phase we got people um, like Richard Teague, for example, who's in Texas and 
are very much involved with AMP grazing and and the like. So really get people who are strong advocates for AMP grazing or proponents on board as well to sort of design a study which then in the end is robust enough to so so the the outcomes can really be can really be used in a, in, in multiple ways. Um, I, I think I don't know. I think what the research really showed is the importance of getting those management data, and that's oftentimes it's oftentimes not easy to get these specific information from from the ranchers. So I think whoever was involved in our study did a really good job to because it's a lot of communication and trust building and all this so i think that that was so important because otherwise we would have just had the grazing systems so i think future studies should really make this a priority as well to be able to not just look at systems amp non-amp or not just look at intense moderate high intensity grazing sort of categorical levels but but really trying to capture gradients which which eventually are much more informative and more useful to then develop management improved or different management practices thanks for that answer i think that's all the time that we have for questions today um there's been lots of people typing in um saying thanks for the presentation and and i do want to mention too um we always ask people for recommendations and your name has been recommended um probably a, a dozen times over the last little while so um i'm glad it worked out that you're able to do a presentation for our um Prairie's got the goods week, and um, I think it's a great way to to finish off our week. So thank you very much, Tim, for the awesome presentation today. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, and thanks everyone for tuning in. And yeah, like I said, please feel free to reach out, and I'm also happy to uh, collect email, like sort of collect contact if people are interested to then send out information once they come available. So if that's of interest in any way, um, feel free to reach out and we can communicate and answer questions. Sure, yeah, that's great. If, if any listeners, um, um, I think most people probably have my contact information, so they're welcome to contact me and I can put them in touch with yeah. you or or yeah. they can touch base with you directly and um, yeah, whatever works. So that's great. Thank you for that, Tim. Um, to all of our listeners, thank you. thank you so much for catching our final webinar. Uh, when you leave today's webinar, a quick one minute survey will pop up if you don't mind filling it out. Uh, we really appreciate getting feedback. Um, and today's webinar has been recorded and will be up um, on YouTube uh, in the near future and yeah with that have a great rest of your day everyone and I hope everyone enjoys a lovely spring weekend so thank you so much bye